For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and this is a new podcast to the Inside Carolina lineup up in the rafters where 2017 ACC Player of the Year and National Champion Justin Jackson and myself will be talking about all things Carolina basketball. Before we get started, though, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Be sure you subscribe to Inside Carolina wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube so you never miss out on any of the content the team at IC puts out. The support doesn't go unnoticed on this end. Speaking of support, we want to support the people that support us. So that's why I've got to mention our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. When it comes to Carolina Apparel, they have everything that you could possibly want. The T-Shirts, the jerseys, the hats, you name it, they will probably have it. It's great people and great customer service since it's locally owned and operated by alumni. You could visit them in person on Franklin Street or online at johnnytshirt.com. And don't forget, Inside Carolina, premium subscribers save 10% on their orders. All right, it's up in the rafters. The up in the rafters team working a bit overtime this week for everybody listening to this. We're recording this at 12.39 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, Justin just got finished with his game with the Texas legends, a, a big win for the legends. They got out to a, a an early lead fought off a, a late comeback by um, the Warriors G league team yeah. and then held off the win. So first, Justin, before we, before we get into the inevitable, how are you doing as a person, as a father, as a friend, <laughs> as a son, I think that's a great way to start this podcast off with a little, a little positivity. light, a little positivity, good energy. I'm good though, man. Uh, get to go home, um, be with my family. About to have All Star break, so I get to have some good time with the family. Uh, obviously, basketball's going well, so really can't complain, man. Now getting, getting to Carolina basketball. Carolina beats a depleted Florida state team over the weekend, 94 to 74. All of a sudden it's starting to look like this team is really clicking outside of that Duke game. And we just have to get through one more game before we could get back on the podcast, talk about some of the things that Carolina is doing, that they're trending in the right direction, going into the postseason. And then in comes Pittsburgh five and 10 in conference play. Pitt is a 14 point underdog in the Dean Dome and inexplicably Carolina loses the game that saw them trail by as much as 20 points um, with about 10 minutes left in the second half before they they made a comeback only to fall a bit short. How do you begin to process a loss as bad as that for this Carolina team? Um. You know, I hate to say it's been the same thing all season, but it's been the same thing all season. You know, they have a game like Florida State where they dismantled them um, from the jump. You know, um, obviously they had some key players out, you know, guys that can really score the ball for them, but they still, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They went out, they handled the business. I think what they were by almost 40 at one point against yeah. Florida State. Um so they do what they were supposed to do. And like you said, it was like, okay, man, it's trending, right? Like we're, we're going in the right direction. And then the Pittsburgh game, man, what's funny is, you know, it's, you know, I should never do it because you can never like discount a team ever. But I was talking to Kenny because Kenny just got back to the States and went to the North Carolina game against Pitt. And, uh, you know, I was joking with them. I'm like, oh, they're playing against Pittsburgh. Like, it's, you know, should be a, a easy one. And I turn on midway through the first half and they're down by 20. And I'm like, like what, like what is going on? Um, but it's just up and downs, man. Like there's no, there's no real consistency. You know, I think one of the biggest things that I see is like their, their energy level is so much different when they're hitting shots, right? Like it's so much different and it's easy. Like as a human, as a, as a basketball player, you feel so much better when you're knocking down shots. But to be a winning team and to make a run in the final four, no matter whether the ball's going in the hoop or not, like you have to have the same level of energy, same level of consistency, no matter what. And I think when I watch the game, I think that's the thing that I see is like you've got a guy as talented as Caleb Love, right? Like the first probably 30, 32 minutes of that game against Pittsburgh, it was hard to kind of find Caleb Love on the court. 
But then all of a sudden he starts scoring, he starts picking up full court, starts being aggressive. And it's like, that has to stay consistent, no matter whether you're eight for 10 or one for 10. And I think when I, when I watch Pittsburgh, that's probably the biggest thing for me is there's just no real consistency when it comes to the effort level on both ends of the floor. Going off that consistency point, what do you think it kind of says about this team where you could watch them the first two, three minutes of a game and kind of get a feel of which Carolina team you're going to see, like the Florida State game you mentioned, the NC State game, they get off to such a hot start and you're like, oh, this is going to be a ridiculously easy game this entire way, when then you compare it to a a Duke game or this latest Pittsburgh game where it's like, all right, this, this team is, is probably going to get run out of the building. Yeah. I mean, I, it's tough, man. Cause it's like I said, I think the biggest thing with consistency, it comes from the leadership that you have on your team, right? Like going into a game as a leader, you're telling your team, Hey, no matter what happens, you know, whether we're, we're knocking down shots or not, we're going to play this way. Right. We're going to we're going to do these things. And I just don't see that necessarily. You know, like I said, a guy like Caleb Love, who should be a leader on their team, and I'm sure he, he is a leader in, in certain aspects. But a guy like him can't be so up and down when it comes to his energy level. You know, it can't it can't be so it can't fluctuate so much based on if he's scoring or knocking down shots, you know, and, and so on and so forth. He's not the only one. I'm just saying him because he's one of the most talented probably one of the biggest leaders that should be on that team. Um, so it comes that, you know, that responsibility comes on it, like comes with him, but like, that's, you know, it, it's one of those things where like, I'm kind of sitting here like, man, like, is there like a different take that we can talk about? Like, is there a different, you know what I'm saying? But it's, it's the same thing. You know, they, they have a great game or they have a good game where you're seeing great signs and then they play a game like that. And it's like, it should be a for sure 10, 15 point win especially at the Dean Dome and, you know, they come out and kind of play flat the way they did for the first, you know, 32, 33 minutes. In his post-game press conference after the Pittsburgh game, um, Hubert Davis said our practice on Monday wasn't very good. How alarming of a statement is that to hear a head coach make 26 games into a season with a team that should be playing with that sense of urgency that he always talks about playing for its postseason life. And then when it, when a coach says that they didn't have a good practice, what, what are they normally talking about in that sense? Um, I mean, I, I think you could probably go back and even the year we won it, coach Williams probably had a couple press conferences where he said we didn't have great practices. Um, so, I mean, I, that's, you know, that's, that's one thing. But I think a point that you made just now was the urgency that they should be playing with, especially now going down the stretch, it has to be at another level. If they really want to win games and they want to make it to the tournament and make a run. Um, at this point, every game matters, right? Like they've let games, you know, they've let losses happen, losses that probably shouldn't happen. Um, but now it's like every game you got to go into this saying, okay, this is, this is the most important game. Coach Williams always used to say this is the most important game because this is today's game, right? Like, and that's the kind of mindset you have to have. You can't let any more games go by, especially against a bad team like that, because now you're not necessarily in a position where you for sure have a, you know, a, a seed in the tournament, right? Now they start looking at bad losses, you know, good wins, that kind of stuff. And if you look at their bad, bad losses and good wins, a Pittsburgh loss isn't something that's going to help you. Um, so it's just that urgency, like you said, is something that they've got to play with from here on out or else, you know, the tournament might look real bleak. Yeah. And the thing I kind of have a hard time with, with this Carolina team is that like second half performance against Pittsburgh. It, I don't know if the game is just easier for, for the team when you are trailing by 20 and a team like Pittsburgh might be taking their foot off the gas a bit and, you know, not doing some of the things that they were doing earlier when they're trying to just protect a, a really big lead. Or if Carolina all of a sudden did flip a switch and we're playing with that sense of urgency where you do get a couple of scores by Caleb Love, you you get somebody like Kerwin Walton, who's been almost a non-factor this year for Carolina. 
looking like the Kerwin Walton we saw his freshman year knocking down shots and playing with a, a little bit of confidence out there. So I think that's something that I kind of struggle with this team knowing, trying to find the balance of if they're playing with a sense of urgency or if they're just down so much that the other team's kind of taking their foot off the gas. But the other the other thing I wanted to ask you from this Pittsburgh game is Coach Davis, he said that he had um, like three points of emphasis um, before the Pittsburgh game. It was rebound the basketball. They they won that in the first half um, by a slight margin, 16 to 15. He said he wanted them to come out playing defense. Pittsburgh shot 56% in the first half, their highest percentage of the year, their their highest point total in the first half this year. And then he also wanted them to take care of the ball. Carolina in the first half had 10 turnovers. Pittsburgh scored 20 pretty easy points off those turnovers. Outside of the leadership issues and more from a a basketball perspective, why do you think it has been so easy to get this team off its game plan at times this season and its losses? Uh, To be honest, man, I think it goes back to the mindset of the players, man. Like, going back to your point as far as how it's confusing as to why they can make that run and play the way they did at the end of the game. A part of it is they started getting stops, but they also were hitting shots, right? And when they hit shots, they look like a completely different team. Well, the game of basketball is a game of up and downs, right? Like you're going to have a game where you just can't buy a bucket. And they had a game earlier in the season where they shot like some crazy low percentage and still came out with a win. But no matter whether you're shooting the ball well or not, it has to be the same energy level as if you're trying to come back by, you know, and you're down by 20. Like if you look, I think something that really, you know, that I looked at in those last probably what, eight minutes or so was the amount of times that they got stops, ran, pushed it, got a layup and transition. And either one of the point guards, RJ or Caleb picked up immediately, right? Like, now, I'm not saying you should pick up 94 feet from the jump, right? Like, at the end of the day, you're going to get tired. But just that kind of aggressiveness has to be played at all times. Whether you're starting the game 0-0, you're up 20, down 20, like, that has to be it the entire time. But when I watch it, watching guys have different levels of energy based on if they're making shots or not is what really – I think as a basketball, like as somebody that loves watching good basketball, I think that's the biggest thing that stands out to me. Um, You know, and and I was talking, I was actually talking with Kenny, um, you know, about kind of, you know, the fact that they were, they were shooting lights out in the first half. Right. And I feel like there's been a lot of games this year where we said that like, man, those, those guys just, they didn't miss. Right. Like they just, they were just knocking down shots. Well, I think it's getting to the point now where it's like, okay, they're knocking down shots because they're getting open looks, right? Like they're getting good looks. It's not that they're just out here handing their face, knocking down shots. And so I think that's kind of why they get, you know, why it gets off of their, their game plan per se is because they didn't come out with that same level of energy that they have to against a team that's at the end of the day, when they come into the Dean Dome, like that's a game that they freaking are ready to play. You know, like they don't get to come to the Dean Dome very often. Some of those guys, they might they might have never been able to been recruited by UNC or any of those high level ACC teams. So it's like when they go into the Dean Dome, it's like, okay, I got something to prove. And I think that's what you saw with Pittsburgh. They went in there and kind of hit them right in the mouth. Yeah, Pittsburgh shot such a high percentage because they were essentially just getting any kind of shot that they wanted um in the dean dome and i think that was that was probably the most eye-opening moment for me when i kind of got around the unc basketball team just like everybody is a a good player everybody gets scholarships for a reason but the ability to hit shots when you're like completely not guarded by anybody it was something that like i kind of never experienced like i always just kind of figured like if you're a good shooter you're going to shoot the same throughout but like you guys when you guys aren't guarded can you kind of speak to that a bit like how much better players at this level and the next level are when they aren't guarded and you have a team like Pittsburgh who comes in with like the lowest field goal percentage but the the quality of shots they were getting against Carolina they might as well have been the only ones out there on the court yeah I mean it's it's for 
really for anybody. Like we say it all the time, like even a guy that can't shoot, if you leave him open, he's going to knock one down. He practices enough of them. Um, and then you add in, you had, you know, Pittsburgh had some shooters out there. If they get an open look, it's like they're shooting in practice. You know what I mean? Like even something as simple as like somebody just running at you makes you kind of start to think like, dang, should I shoot this or should I drive? You know what I mean? But when you're ba basically just being able to line it up, you know, with nobody around you, I mean, it's like a practice shot. Like that's literally like, that's a warm up. you know? So I think that's the problem is when you've got, obviously you're going to have shooters that are going to hit tough shots sometimes, right? Like there's some great basketball players out there, but you have to make it hard on everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't just miss, you can't do missing assignment after missing assignment and they just get wide open looks, especially at the beginning of the game. Because in the Dean Dome, if you get going in, in the beginning of the game, it's hard to come back. But when you punch them in the mouth as North Carolina, when you punch them in the mouth first, make everything hard on them, get the crowd into it, it's hard for them, right? And I think it's been – it was the other way around for Pittsburgh. Like the crowd couldn't really get into it until that second half when they started making that run. And that's one of the biggest things about being in the Dean Dome is that, that, that fan base out there. Yeah, the – I forgot what I was listening, what podcast I was listening to from inside Carolina, but they were basically saying that the crowd did everything they could to try to get Carolina back into this game. And you, you kind of saw towards the end, the team feeding off that momentum only for their attempt at the comeback to come up a bit short late, but I have two quotes that I wanted to read to you. And then I have a follow-up question about those quotes. The first one was from Hubert Davis in the post-game press conference following the pit game. He said, there have been more times than not that we don't handle and we can't respond to that type of physicality. And so what can we do against that to fight that is to be physical ourselves. And that's something that that's a narrative and a reputation that we're going to have to change. And then along those same lines, uh, B dot the UNC um, six man, the UNC host in, in arena host, he tweeted a quote from uh, Jason Capel, who played at Carolina and is now on the Pittsburgh coaching staff. He said, like we said, make it a dog fight. They cute over here now, Dot. They cute over here now. Just make it a dog fight. They don't want that. How does Carolina shed this narrative that they are a team that shies away from physicality? And when when you when you make it a tough game for them, they're they're going to cower away because I feel like that's the the narrative that teams are kind of coming with against this team that they're just going to try to push them around. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it goes all back to the the energy and effort, man. Like b physicality and being soft. That's like one of my biggest like I can't stand when people use oh he's soft or. You can't play soft because I feel like people take that in a way of, okay, if you're not strong, if you're not big, like you got to get bigger. You know what I mean? But with the talent and the athleticism and I think the IQ that some of these guys have, you can play hard and outsmart teams that are just trying to be physical, right? Like you look at, you look at the big fellow that Pittsburgh had down low, um, can't remember his name but you look at him and the way he was pushing the way he was going for every offensive rebound like the way he was really working out there physically you can outsmart that you can outplay that like you can work harder than that every single game right like just being a brute isn't what's going to what like good basketball teams need but when it comes to like him saying, you know, first of all, if I was on that team or if I was that coaching staff, I would be pissed that somebody's out here talking in that way about us. Like that's, and I'm not even somebody to get riled up about, you know, somebody talking trash or whatever, but for another ACC coach to basically say, oh, if we get physical with them or, you know, we, you know, we make a dog fight, they're going to Former back Carolina player too. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's like, that's like a, a punch in the face. Like, well, dang. Okay. So for one, they got to take that personally. For two, it's all about the energy and effort. Like Coach Williams always said, like, I can't coach energy and effort. Like I can coach X's and O's. I can do all of this. I can do all of that. But I cannot coach energy and effort. 
Like when it comes to that, that's on y'all. So for the players, they've got to come out ready to play. If they would have come out ready to play and hit Pittsburgh first, guarantee you, for one, that game would have been that way. But those coaches also wouldn't have been saying that. You know what I'm saying? Like, but exactly what they said happened when they came out and they hit them one time, like it was, they were up 20 all of a sudden. So I just think the team themselves have to, has to take every game personally, right? I don't care what, what their rankings are in the ACC. I feel like mentally they have to go out there knowing, okay, we're about to get this team's best shot, right? Like we've got to come out and play. I don't care if it's whoever's last in the ACC, we've got to come out here and we've got to go hard from the jump. And if we can do that, if we don't make shots, if, if they have a crazy night, so be it. But I don't feel like we've had a game where they've lost and we've said, man, they were working their butts off. They just, the other team was just better. You know what I'm saying? Like there hasn't been a game like that when they lose. It's like, well, dang, like, what do we do about the energy level? You know what I mean? Like, what do we do about when they get, when a run happens, like they just lay down, you know what I mean? Like that's how it's been. It has never been that the team was just better. You know, the yeah. team just hits some crazy shots. So I think they just got to take it personally from here on out unless, you know, unless their end goal isn't to make the tournament and make it make a run. But if they want to do that, they got to take that personal now. Yeah, your your teams at Carolina, I wouldn't associate you guys as having like brutes or having enforcers or anything on your team. Nobody showing up to the court with like some black Air Force is just looking to bully people. <laughs> Just, just menaces in, in the all black sneakers. Um, oh, always hated that. Whenever I showed up to a pickup game and I saw that, that's that was my first sign to get out of there. So, how did you guys kind of counter that narrative when you guys don't have the the enforcers or the bully type teams, but knowing that you are wearing the North Carolina jersey and every team is coming to give you their best shot. Yeah, I mean, it's just – it's all about being uh, – all about the smarts, right? When it comes to defense, for instance, like bigger, stronger guys playing defense, like they might be able to play better one-on-one -on -one defense because they can kind of, you know, bump guys off their spot or, you know, they might be able to box out better than, you know, somebody that's maybe like my build. But when it comes to defense, okay, if we're not the biggest – like you said, I mean, we had – I love them too, but we had Marcus Page – who was not a very big built guy. We had me. Um, I mean, we had Joel, who was the freaking hoss, but we had Bryce, who wasn't crazy big. And then we had Big Kennedy down there. And then you had guys like Theo, um, Nate, all guys that, you know, weren't really just these like muscled up type guys. But when it comes to defense, okay, if I'm not going to be this big brute, okay, I'm going to make sure that I'm in the right spot every single time. Right. Like if there's a baseline drive, I'm going to be there to help every time. If there's some sort of slot cut, I'm going to make sure that I take the cutter and talk it out with somebody. Like there's so many more things that you can do when it comes to like IQ to overcome maybe being a little bit at a deficit when it comes to physicality. Um, you know, and then on the offensive end, it's like, okay, if a team wants to get a team wants to get physical with this, deny us, okay, let's get some backdoor cuts. You know what I mean? Like let's, let's use their physicality to our advantage. Um, so there's ways to get around it. Like, obviously, like you said, we didn't have, you know, these big old brutes at all, but there's ways around it to still play good basketball and still compete no matter how big the other team might be. We've talked about the, the current players on the team a lot. And from the outside looking in, it's, it's hard to evaluate the, the job of the staff in particular, because, all we're doing is really looking at the results. When you were at Carolina, can you shed some light what the roles were of the assistant coaches on the staff and how did they play a part in the team's overall success? Yeah, I mean, you know, Coach Williams obviously ran the ship, you know, like his his word was, you know, what was happening. But I think he did a good job of like allowing the assistants to kind of have a say so or, you know, they'd be in coaches meetings all the time. Um and I think what the assistants did when I was there, Coach Rob, um, Coach Davis at the time, they did a good job of like kind of being that um, like that ear, you know, per se, like building that relationship. If you wanted to watch some extra film, you could go watch some film with them. Um, but they did a good job of kind of 
like reiterating what coach was saying, maybe in a way that you could understand a little bit better, you know, for you personally. And so I think that's kind of what the assistants did when I was there. I think one thing that I love that coach Davis is doing is player development, you know, has been, he's upped player development quite a bit. And so I think now you kind of see like some assistants, um, some GAs, um, kind of taking that player development side a little bit differently. Um, and so I love to see that, but I think that's kind of how the assistants kind of work is just, you know, whatever coach Davis might say, but then also like their job is to kind of, you know, continue to talk through things with the players on maybe a way in a way that maybe that individual can understand better than like as a whole, if that makes sense. As somebody who's part of the, the Carolina basketball family and everybody else is from the outside looking in when Hubert Davis took the job, he said that to coach here, you've had to have played here. I'm curious to get your opinion. Why do you think he's taken that approach with his experience, not only playing in the NBA under some of the best basketball minds, um, Don Nelson, Pat Riley, when he was with the Knicks, but also winning a championship while he was an assistant at Carolina with, with coaches like coach Rob and CB McGrath, who didn't play for Carolina, but as somebody who's a part of the, the Carolina basketball family, can, can you kind of shed some light on the importance of wanting everything to kind of stay within the family and how that might benefit the program? Yeah. I mean, you know, for people on the outside, it's easy for them to sit there and say, Oh, coach Davis isn't the one we should have hired somebody else. Um, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, what's funny is there was also a lot of people saying that they wanted somebody different than coach Williams. And those same people are saying that they want coach Williams back. Right. So like a lot of the fans and stuff on the outside don't know at all what they're talking about. I'm just going to keep it 100 with everybody. Like they don't really understand, but when it comes to the um, keeping it inside the Carolina family, I think the importance of that is that North Carolina just isn't another college basketball team, right? Like there's so much more that goes into Carolina basketball than just games on the floor, right? It might seem like to fans, it's like, oh, we're having losing seasons. We're not winning games, but the whole brotherhood, the family aspect off the court, like teaching the players what to do off the court, all of that stuff goes into it. And I think if you're not from that family, if you haven't been within it, then you don't understand that, you know, not saying that there, there wasn't a ton of other coaches that could do an amazing job, you know, in the spot that coach Davis is doing. But when it comes to that, that's how you want to keep Carolina basketball. You want to keep Carolina basketball the way it's been for however long it's been in existence. And so I think when, you know, you have people on the outside saying, man, like we should have hired, you know, I heard a few different names go down whenever they were trying to find it, but we should have hired so-and-so instead of coach Davis. I think a big thing that, that, that fans have to realize is, and I think I had mentioned this before, coach Davis can only do so much, right? Like he can only do so much with this team. If the players themselves aren't available to play or aren't ready to play, then you can't even evaluate the coaching staff, to be honest with you. Like you can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't say that a coaching staff is doing a terrible job when the players go out there and they're losing by 20 in the first half to a Pittsburgh team who is five and 10 in the ACC. Like you just, you can't, you can't evaluate a coaching staff like that. But when it goes, when it comes to the coaches that are there, I think it's the coaches that are supposed to be there right now. And I think, if the team comes around a little bit, I think the coaching staff will be able to do things and help the team win games down the stretch. And that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> and that's what I believe. So I think that's the importance of Carolina basketball and keeping it inside Carolina basketball is all of those other little things that you don't necessarily see on the court. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to get your perspective. Like you mentioned, I think everybody kind of has their own opinions on, you know, how, how much of the Carolina family should be involved um, in the coaching, whether it's the head coach or whether it's every assistant, whether it's some kind of 
combination of mixing insiders and outsiders and trying to keep the, those principles together. So I thought it was just, it was uh, good to kind of get your opinion on it as somebody who's kind of been a part of it and been, been through it with the Carolina basketball family reaching levels that everybody's kind of hoping that this program gets back to. And Carolina, even though they, they still don't have a signature win on its resume, up until the Pittsburgh game, the team didn't have a bad loss. Now it has to do something to offset that performance. And right on cue, Carolina heads to Virginia Tech, an opportunity for UNC to pick up its first quad one win of the season. Side note, I'm, I feel like I've never heard the phrase quad one more than I've heard it this season. It's like, well, I, it's like every tweet, quad one, quad one, quad one. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> I, I really had no idea. I had just heard good wins and bad losses. That's all I heard. And then all of a sudden, people start throwing out quad one wins. And I'm like, what? Like, are we just making stats about everything? Like, I just I just had to preface this question by saying I have never heard the phrase quad one win more than I have this season. I know it's a, a different coach now and a different style from when you went to Virginia Tech your sophomore year. But where does Blacksburg rank for you in terms of difficult places to play in Castle Coliseum? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough place. Um, for one, uh, the environment, the fans, they come out to those games. Um, two, the court is a little different. Like the court's like kind of like sunk down, like underneath the seats almost. Um, it's a little darker in there just because of their colors. Um but it's a hostile environment. Like those fans come out and especially when we were there, like they, they come out there and then a Virginia tech team, man, th those guys, you know, even when they played them first at the Dean dome, like they play hard, you know, those guys, they get after it. So, you know, going into an environment like that, especially off of a loss like that, they should have every motivation. Like, all right, let's go in here and shut these guys up, you know? Um, so hopefully they go in there with that mindset. Virginia tech for me, it feels like I've never had a good experience at Virginia Tech, even though the best moment of my college football career was at Virginia Tech when we won in 2015 to clinch the Coastal in Frank Beamer's last game. But it feels like every other time I'm there, Carolina football is just kind of getting embarrassed and I'm kind of getting embarrassed knowing, knowing some of the things I've said. And it's just, it's just never a good experience. Do you have any schools like that where when you think of going there and – making a road mm -hmm. trip you're like oh just just nothing but bad memories georgia tech <laughs> georgia tech was the worst bro oh man i think we only lost once but like we never had a i personally never had like a clean game against georgia tech like it was always either a bad shooting night we lost the game or it was just like a rough nasty game um but yeah georgia tech is definitely definitely the place that I, when i think of that it's just like, man, like it shouldn't be this bad, but I just, I, I, I don't like it. Like, I don't like it here. For going back to games for Carolina, you've crossed off going to Georgia Tech. You guaranteed. Yeah, yeah, guaranteed. I'll watch them on TV when, when they go to Georgia Tech and I'll cheer them on, but I, I can't, I can't step foot in that, in that arena. That's exactly where I'm at with Virginia Tech. So you could, <laughs> you could guarantee I won't be in Blacksburg on Saturday for Carolina's <laughs> game, but Carolina Saturday 4 p.m. Eastern time against Virginia Tech and then a quick turnaround back to the Dean Dome Monday hosting Louisville 7 p.m. Me and Justin will be back next week to break it down as a part of the up in the rafters team but Justin appreciate the time hope you hope you stay good until then man hey man you sleep well man it's always oh, it's too. always a pleasure <laughs> I'm about to dive into this bet. <laughs>